presentation to it either. Um, this is a talk about Linksys router firmware. Uh, that's not true. Nope. Ah! That's what I wanted. Okay. So, hello everybody. Thank you for uh, joining. Sorry we started a little bit late. Don't need to do that. Um, so this is a, not a super technical talk. It's mostly kind of like an exploration in um, an art project that has a tech component to it. So there's sort of two pieces. I'm going to be going through how I made the physical structure and then also kind of what the guts are. I'm going to try to go real fast. Um, so hello, my name is Ben Purdy. Um, I'm sort of a creative technologist person. I have a background in software development and I've been doing um, interactive technology work for probably about seven or eight years uh, since then. Um, at, at an agency and now at my uh, uh, company called Globox, where we do digital interactive stuff. Um, so that's kind of my background and that's why I like to do stuff like this and why I'm at this sort of conference. It's, it's sort of the, the intersection of creative work with technology work, which is really fun, as everyone knows. Uh, so this project is called Be Still My Low Poly Heart. Um, essentially what it is, I don't know if any of you had a chance to try it last night, it was in sort of heartbeat monitor mode. Uh, so it has two, uh, two ways of working. And the original concept was that I wanted to try making a physical piece as the primary project because typically a lot of my uh, work is really software oriented. And so there's all this tooling and PCs that have to be involved and all of this stuff to, to get a piece sort of stood up and, and working. I wanted to build something that was interesting physically on its own and then try to kind of put some interactivity and some tech into it as sort of like the additional piece, but not a requirement for it existing. Um, and so uh, the concept was to make an interesting object. I wanted to try out some new fabrication techniques and then also have it uh, be a sort of a participatory experience where the, the, the observer was sort of like giving signal to this object and then it would reflect it back through this visualization of heartbeats. Um, and so why would I want to do something like this? Like I mentioned, a lot of my projects had a lot of infrastructure, so there was sort of this like IT burden on myself to make my projects work and uh, I wanted to try like not having that be the case and have it be sort of more like an appliance or a sculptural piece. Um, and like I said, I wanted this to be first a sculpture and then secondarily a piece of interactive art. Uh, and then trying the new fabrication techniques. And those involve a lot of robots and there's always a good reason to use robots. Um, so, like I said, a little ahead of myself here, um, it's basically just a way to visualize a, a human surrogate's uh, heartbeat signal and kind of reflect that back to them and also to visualize something that w is always hopefully going on in all of us but is this very personal thing that we don't really see externalized for other people uh, to experience but it's like core to our existence and survival. Um, so uh, to start off with, uh, because I wanted to be pr uh, physically prim physical primarily, um, I needed to figure out a way to make this thing and so uh, the real problem I ran into is that I'm, I'm not a 3D modeler. Uh, I have Blender that I use as kind of like a utilitarian piece of software, um, but I'm by no means good at it. Uh, and so I wanted to make something that resembled an anatomical heart, which is not a simple form. And I also wanted it to be low poly aesthetic, but I didn't want it to be triangulated. Because a lot of low poly technique, and it's, this is not a, like a dig on the, the aesthetic, but it, it's common that you'll see people take a model and then just run like a, a decimation filter of some sort, which will typically triangulate it rather than creating like complicated polygons. Uh, and so the idea that I came up with um, to get around my lack of skill was to find a really good reference model, which is this anatomical heart model, and then I just put a giant rectangular block around it, and then I used another giant rectangular block and Boolean operators in, um, in Blender, which is something I, I am able to do, and I just basically carved off big chunks until it was approximately the same silhouette, uh, and then I had this form, which is the one that you see here. Uh, so now I've got uh, this OBJ file, which is the, the thing I want to build. Um, and I, I figured it would be laser cut plywood as, a sh as the uh, sort of the manifold. And then I would 3D print little interior brackets. And then I would put LEDs inside and people would walk up and this light would shine through the cracks. It would be really cool. Uh, but then there are no cracks because I was using lasers and 3D printers to make all this stuff. Uh, and it was way too precise. So I actually have the plywood one here and I had to remake it with acrylic because you can't see light through the cracks. Um, so that's an interesting lesson there. Um, so I had all the, uh, that sort of uh, plan of, of how to do all these things. Um, and I didn't want to like go out and buy a bunch of material and spend time on lasers. 
uh, if I wasn't sure it was going to work out. And so typically when I'm doing this kind of exploratory process related work, uh, I'll kind of sneak up on it and iterate a lot. I know that's a common way to approach it, but um, it's something that has served me well. So uh, I started with like a really, really simple um, just blob that I used Pepecura to, to sort of split out and then I you know, made it out of paper and I'm like, is this even interesting at all? Uh, and I thought, yeah, that's kind of interesting. And so then I did that 3D modeling process, came up with the, uh, the form, 3D printed it in a, at a small scale, and I was like, well, is this also interesting? And then I also uh, made a foam core mock-up, which is with tape and foam core, at the, the full scale that you see here. Um, and that was the point where I, where I was convinced that you know, it was worth going out and buying a bunch of acrylic and plywood and doing laser cutting and all that. Uh, one interesting side note is that to cut the uh, foam core, I didn't want to have to like measure everything out or print a million pieces of paper and tape them together. So I just used projection mapping software and I projected the outlines on uh, like perspective corrected onto my workbench and then literally just traced them out with an X-Acto knife. So that's kind of a fun technique. If you don't need super high precision and you just want to make something quickly, that's just another piece of the uh, foam core one coming together. Um, so I knew I wanted to make the thing. Uh, I, knew I had the, the cut file. Or, or rather the model, and so I figured, okay, I'm going to need precise vector outlines of each face. Uh, I'm going to need a bunch of different connectors because the way that I wanted to assemble this thing was rather than having an, a complicated frame inside, I was just going to create specific 3D printed brackets that would join each unique set of faces. And so all of the, because it's sort of a, a haphazard model, none of these, uh, none of the angles between the faces are are in any way planned. They're all just completely arbitrary angles, and so there none, no two faces come together at the same angle. Um, and so uh, the way I approached this was just to take the 3D model and kind of treat that as my ground truth. Um, but the problem is that most 3D model file formats are just kind of like triangle soup. Like there's no correlation between any two faces. They're just sort of like a bunch of polygons because you're just going to render it as pixels anyway. But that doesn't work when you want to actually know interesting things about the model. Uh, and so the good news is that OBJ files are really, really straightforward, and they're very easy to parse. Um, and so what I ended up doing was making a really, really quick and dirty WebGL tool that would parse the OBJ file and then create relationships between the shared edges and the faces so that I could understand things about the relationships between the faces and place you know, uh, little screw holes where they needed to be so that the adjacent face would have it in the same spot and all of that sort of like structured data that actually has like relevance to the geometry of the thing. Um, so I can show that. Nope. I don't know how well, okay, good. You can see that, good. So this is the, the little, again, this is like really crude, but this is uh, the tool that I created to take the, each face and create an SVG vector output um, from it. And so with this tool, I can kind of iterate through the different edges, uh, and I can select different faces. And then on this 3D model over here, you can see the red face is the one that is selected, and then the yellow line is the, uh, the edge that's selected. And then just through the debug console, I had some commands where I could add or remove screw holes and move them around, which is important because some of the, some of the faces have like very tight um, amounts of surface area where you need to kind of manually nudge the connectors around so they don't bonk into each other. Uh, and so this worked great. I was able to spit out all the SVG files that I needed to cut, and then all of the uh, angles between all the faces that I could then feed into the next step. And that is the 3D brackets for the, uh, the screws. And I don't know if anyone here has played with OpenSCAD. Anybody? OK, cool. Yeah, so OpenSCAD is like a 3D modeling package, but instead of using visual tools to, uh, to do your modeling, you basically script it like code and it uses uh, solid constructive geometry to create the, uh, the output. And so you're basically creating a script to make the 3D thing. And because you're creating a script to make the 3D thing, you can then automate that script and inject variables. And so what I ended up with was a, an open SCAD file that made a little bracket, uh, and then I could just feed in the angle that I wanted, and it would update to, uh, to reflect that exact angle. And so I just automated that, and it spit out 80-something unique STL files that I could then 3D print. Uh, and one of the problems with that is that they all looked almost exactly the same. And so I had to come up with this process where I would pop them off the 3D print bed, immediately put them on to the face they were supposed to be on. <laughs> and it was sort of this like very slow process. I should have built something in where I could identify the parts, but they were already kind of small, which would make that tricky. Um, so I'm going to show that. 
very quickly. Dynamic bracket. So this is the little bracket. Uh, it's just like a little, it's sort of like an angle bracket, but I can customize the angle. Uh, and this is one of the face angles. As you can see, like, this is what came out of the JavaScript tooling. So it's like these really just screwy angles. But I can uh, set this to anything. And then if I update it here, you can see that the angle changed over here. And so I ended up with a whole bunch of these little tiny parts. They're about, you know, I don't know, about an inch or so long uh, with two little holes that I tapped for, uh, for threaded connectors. What? Come on. There we go. Uh, so this is sort of the final pipeline. I basically talked through it at this point. Like I came up with the OBJ file using my really awesome 3D modeling skills. I ran that model through my little uh, JavaScript um, kind of like preprocessor, which gave me the STL files and the uh, um, SVG files. And then I had to manually pack the faces together in Illustrator to create the laser cut template for the laser cutter, which is something that would be good to automate. Um, and then it was like send off the file to get laser cut and then print a whole bunch of 3D brackets and then like it went together like a Lego kit of very like sort of non-orthogonal Legos, um, which was really fun because like the more I got the thing together, the more it kind of like put itself together, like the faces would just plop right onto the connectors. Uh, it's a very satisfying process. Um, one thing though, it's if you're working with 3D modeling, it's really nice because you can avoid physics and everything is like, you know, 2D planes that have no thickness. And so the way that I modeled this thing, the, the brackets, are on the interior of the faces, but the material has thickness. And so most of this model is convex, which is great, but there are a few concavities sort of up towards the top. Uh, and I didn't notice that until I had already kind of finished all the tooling. Uh, and so if you get this kind of situation, the thickness of the material causes a collision with itself. And so I don't really have a, an automated solution for that. I, I don't think it would be tricky to build one, um, but it is something that it, when you're mostly working in the digital domain, uh, it's something that's easy to forget that there's things like tolerances and material thicknesses and all of that that you have to think about when you're doing physical engineering. Um, so the the rule there is that you know robots will do exactly what you tell them to do, uh, and so you need to account for that stuff. And one of the other things I had to account for, and luckily I caught this earlier in the process, is that you know even with a laser cutter, which is a very fine curve, like the material that's lost when you're doing the cutting operation, I still had to account for that in the connectors. The first batch of connectors that I made was too tight by like just fractions of a millimeter, but it made a difference because as I was putting the piece together, that was sort of a cumulative error. So the more pieces I got together, the worse it fit. And I had to reprint the batch of connectors. Um, so uh, thinking through like what I would do with this process, um, it's interesting to think about the, the sort of manual sticking points and how you can get rid of them. Um, I think automating the part packing and layout for laser cutting or you know, CNC or plasma cutting, whatever you want to do, uh, that's kind of critical because that was really tedious and it's very solvable. Um, handling the concavity would be a good thing to do. Uh, and then also, instead of 3D printing brackets, um, I think it'd be pretty straightforward to make like a slot mechanism so you could make the brackets out of the same material that the, the hull is made from. And then you could imagine, you know, you could do this out of like a uh, water jet cut plate steel and you could weld it together and make giant like house sized crazy looking uh, forms out of this thing. Because uh, once it goes together it's very rigid once the entire manifold is complete. Um, and then yeah, make giant things out of it. Um, so that's the physical piece. That's usually where I stop but I wanted to talk about the electronics a little bit because this is teardown and like there's so much cool electronics stuff going on here. Um, it's not like I feel like very humbled by the amount of, uh, of talent and experience that is at the conference. So this is all like very DIY level electronic stuff. Um, but basically it's a, got a sensor to, to de detect your heartbeat. It's got obviously RGB lighting in it uh, and then a microcontroller to run that RGB lighting and to listen for the uh, pulse sensor. Um, pulse sensors, it turns out, use a, a principle called pho photoplasmography. I think that's how you pronounce that. Uh, and that's basically like the process of shining light through your fingertip, like we've all done with bright LEDs. Um, and then you measure the amount of light that's transmitting through the finger. And then as your blood flow increases in, or the amount of blood increases and decreases in conjunction with your heartbeat, the amount of light that can transmit through your finger decreases a tiny bit with each beat. And it's a tiny, tiny signal to noise ratio, uh, which is a real challenge because even just uh, moving around, like moving your body around a little bit will cause so much noise that it's almost impossible to get a steady thing or a steady signal out of it. Um, most heart rate sensors are just showing you an average BPM. I want to, like what this does is it visualizes each individual heartbeat. And so I can't just like 
average it out and it'll look fine. Um, and so that was really tricky to get this working consistently and it still is not, like it's not a, a sure thing that it'll work with everybody. Um, what I ended up using is a thing called the Easy Pulse Sensor by Embedded Lab. Uh, there are a couple different fingertip pulse sensors that you can find online, like at Adafruit and SparkFun. There's a really common one that's like a little round PCB that you just press your finger onto. I tried that one and it was way too unreliable. I, I would have to instruct people on how to use it every time. And I wanted this to be a little more like self-directed. And so this uh, pulse sensor has a little silicon sleeve that goes over your finger and so it provides kind of like a uniform pressure. Uh, it's less subject to how someone's pushing on it. I also found that people would push really hard on that other pulse sensor and then you're restricting all the blood flow to your finger and it stops working. So it's like, it's kind of hard to, uh, to uh, get these things working in a way that anyone can just walk up and have success with it. Um, the LEDs happen to be the Adafruit Dot Star, which is just uh, their branded version of the APA 102 controllable LED. I just happen to have a strip of 30 of them. That's why that's what's in there. Um, there are just two perpendicular rings of uh, there's 30 LEDs total with two perpendicular rings that are, um, I guess, going or kind of around the vertical axes. Uh, and that's enough because of the diffusion in the form that you can get really good positional lighting control. Um, the whole thing is just driven by an Arduino because, again, it was like what I had on my bench. Um, and that does a little bit of extra filtering. The, uh, the easy pull sensor does a lot for you, um, but there's still, like, as someone's putting the, the thing on, you can get a lot of, like, extra beats. And so there's some temporal filtering in the Arduino where it waits and kind of watches the, the uh, pulse data coming in until it, there's a mostly stable rhythm to it, and then it'll start to visualize it. Um, and that helps a lot of like, you know, as someone's putting the thing on, it doesn't freak out. Uh, and then it, the, the pattern that it shows when there's a heartbeat uh, is just a preset kind of like offset um, gradient that I pulse on the LEDs. It's not showing like both of the, I don't know what you'd call that. There's some word for the two different beats of each heartbeat. Yes, the love and the dub. Uh, and then later on, I bet I've had this in my studio, and I didn't want to have to have someone standing there with their finger in the sensor to have it doing something. And so I, um, I discovered the ESP8266, and I was like, well, these are great. I can just put them in everything now. And so it has an ESP8266 in it, uh, and it just listens on UDP, and I can just throw bytes at it, and it will just interpret that as RGB across the 30 LEDs. And so it's sort of like a... Um, easy to control lighting thing that I can have uh, over in the corner and do interesting stuff with it. Um, that's the ESP8266, or at least a, a form factor of it that's really easy to find. Um, a little bit frustrating to integrate with, but it's also like just a couple bucks. Um, and so this is my silly little demo. Uh, I can show like the different rings and how they, uh, how they can provide some positional illumination. So this is one of the rings kind of going this way. And then this is the other ring that's going this way. Uh, and so between those two, I actually have a, a demo that I, I built, um, only works at the studio where my Vive is set up, where I can use the Vive controllers as virtual light sources, and they'll kind of light up just the area of the outside of the heart where uh, the controller is, as if you were, were holding a torch. And so, um, again, it doesn't take like a lot of light or a lot of discrete LEDs to create that kind of impression that there's like relatively complex lighting going on. Um, and most of the time it just goes in this lava lamp mode. Um, all right, so the physical assembly is uh, it's interesting because this is all about like diffuse lighting against the outside of the interior of this piece. And so uh, I needed to avoid things like shadows. I couldn't have a really complicated fixture inside to hold the, um, the LED and the brain of the thing. Uh, and so what I ended up doing is just using three springs and some really fine wire and so it's kind of like on a, a spring harness, just kind of suspended directly in the middle of the, uh, of the thing. And so again, this isn't like high quality engineering. This was built for, a, a, I, I submitted this to a, a group tech art show before I had finished it. And so there was some hasty, like kind of getting this thing working at the last second stuff going on, which I'm sure no one has any experience with that because it never happens. Um, but this is what it looks like. Again, it's pretty crude. I just broke off at, like the, the kind of the in-between pieces of the laser cut frame and uh, glued them together to make this little acrylic um, shape that's sort of like a cross cut through the piece. And then I suspended the Arduino and then the, you can sort of see the uh, easy pull sensor is this red PCB on the back. And then it's got a um, buck converter power supply here uh, because one of the things I found sort of late in the game was that the fluctuation in, the in like the voltage when the LEDs would all light up 
was enough to trigger the pulse sensor because again, that signal to noise ratio is so tiny. And then the thing would, uh, because there was this pulsing pattern to the LEDs, it would cause a pulsing fluctuation in the power and then the pulse sensor would be like, oh, that's a heartbeat for sure. And it would get just become a feedback loop with itself. And so it's, it's like the way the power works in this thing is totally wonky. So I had to basically isolate the logic from the LED circuitry. Um, and I happened to have a buck converter laying around and that did the trick. The initial show that I showed this in, I literally just had two wall warts hidden inside it, like one for the LEDs and one for the, uh, the microcontroller. Um, here's an, a, the, a close up of one of the spring suspensions. So again, there's like kind of two on the bottom and one on the top, which is nice because you can, it can take like a, a bump and it, it's sort of like having internal shock absorbers. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty robust to, uh, to travel it around, which is nice. Again, there, there's like kind of a zoomed out view of the whole thing inside the heart. And I'm happy to take one of the panels off if anybody wants to check out the, uh, the guts of it. Um, these are two hyphens. Uh, <laughs> so I, I learned a lot of stuff. I try to, I try to like, reflect on projects even like this was just kind of a, a, a side project for fun um, for this uh, tech art show um, but I like to think about kind of like reflect on the the way that I approached a, a thing or uh, things that I learned along the way um, and one of the one of the things I did in the process of making this was I tried to be like just just scrappy enough to get the thing done and not try to like make a library like a full-fledged framework or library around any of it so like that the 3d tool in the browser was like I was literally like just using the debug console to get the, the data out of it and using it as a visualizer. Um, and then the other kind of big piece here is that like once I created that OBJ file, that was kind of like the ground, again, like the ground truth. So I used that same exact OBJ to kind of like feed the entire rest of the process. And I feel like it's really important to kind of like get comfortable with, uh, with data and standards that you can use in a malleable way uh, and try not to allow your kind of like your source material to get stuck in a format or, uh, or go through some sort of process where you're losing precision or you're losing access to any sort of like relational aspect of the data because um, um, it can be kind of like this really important thing all the way through the process. Um, and that's about it. How did I do? Oh my God, how is that even possible? Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, Again, if anybody wants to see the inside of this uh, or see the software or talk about how any of like the ESP 8266 pieces work, I'd be happy to answer questions. Go ahead. What kind of plastic did you use to 3D print the connectors? Uh, it's just PLA. Okay. Yeah, I had a, uh, a MakerBot Simple Metal at the time. Okay. Or PrinterBot, sorry. Anything you would do differently? Anything I would do differently. Um, yeah, I would probably put more effort into the the framework on the inside if I would had more time because the the way, the way that the LEDs are oriented is not great. The density of the LED strip is is pretty sparse. Um, I'd probably just run it all off of like an ESP eighty two sixty six at this point. The Arduino is doing almost nothing. Uh, it's just the the original incarnation of this didn't have the Wi Fi piece, um, but the Arduino does not need to be there. Um, I think that's about it. Yes. Yes, I wanted to find a way to be able to put this in a window and have people like out on the sidewalk come by and sort of feed it somehow. Um, obviously, now that it's got Wi-Fi connectivity, like I could, I could do a, a sort of like a web portal where people could control it and all of that sort of stuff, which would be fun. Oh yeah, yeah. There's that weird, like sort of amplifying, just like the flushness of their face. Yeah, that that would totally work, or I would imagine that would work. <laughs> um, I guess that's it. Oh yeah, that's really hard to see. Uh, BenPurdy.com is my personal site. Globox.io is my studio, um, and I'm at PurdyBot on Twitter. So if you have any, again any questions or even at, like later on, I'm gonna put this back downstairs if you wanted me to pop it open or, or chat about it. Just let me know. Oh, How heavy is it? Uh, the the heart itself is almost uh, almost not heavy at all. That's <laughs> a helpful answer. I would say it's like maybe a pound. It's really it's quite light. It's because it's completely hollow. It's just it's the weight of the, that amount of acrylic and an Arduino. Cool. All right. Thanks. Let's go eat lunch.